right here because this is the first article I pulled up. And I uh, have known for a long time that your gum disease affects heart disease. And I remember the first time I heard it, um, it was well after medical school. We weren't thinking or we weren't being taught this way at all in medical school. But, you know, and I was thinking, ah, how, how are they going to put this together? But as you might imagine, because we're getting to not just the correlations of uh, different uh, aspects of our health and our diseases, but we're getting to the root of them. And we know that one of the roots, a huge major root is chronic inflammation. So I scanned this article, uh, more evidence ties gum disease with heart disease. And this came from uh, research out of Sweden. And they are, they've been researching gum disease and this was a follow-up study. Now, you know, we like to do review articles more so than individual studies, but this was a pretty big study. Um, it included 1,600 participants. And when I say pretty, pretty big, pretty big for an individual study. Um, when we study review articles, they might cover 100,000 100, participants when you add up all of the individuals and all of the research. But uh, they did this research over about six years and um, dental examinations uh, showed 985 had good dental health, 489 had moderate periodontitis, periodontitis. Now, whenever you see itis, what does that mean? That means inflammation. So, uh, during this average of six years, people with gum disease were 49% more likely to die from any cause, having a non-fatal heart attack or stroke, or to develop severe heart failure. So those are some pretty big odds there, 49% more likely. Now, uh, did they come to the same conclusion we have as far as the importance of inflammation, we'll look at this paragraph right here. The researchers suspect that damage to the gum tissue in people with gum disease may allow germs to enter the bloodstream. And here's the quote, this could accelerate harmful changes to the blood vessels and or enhance systemic inflammation that is harmful to the, the vessels. So they're, they're starting to get a clue, right? And you know, the dentists are the front of the pack with a lot of the research that really interests us. So let's look at something else. So that's your uh, um, gum disease tied with heart disease. All right, what else might be tied with heart disease? Well, Let's see, let's keep on going down the gastrointestinal tract, right? We go from our gums, our mouth, uh, down into the gut. High fat diet, gut bacteria and heart disease, exploring the connection. So here are the, here are the bullets. A high fat diet disrupts the inner workings of the gut. And this, may contribute to cardiovascular disease risk, according to a recent study. So again, this is a study. Once, um, let's just keep going. The researchers investigated the link between greasy diets, gut microbes, and the risk of developing heart diseases. This was in mice. The findings may shed light on the exact mechanism through which high fat diets increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and this is what we also want to know, how to prevent these negative outcomes. So high fat diets, such as the one uh, that includes plenty of fast foods. And uh, Mr. Hope has a slide in his deck on this standard American diet. And, you know, we question 
how much of it is really food, uh, it increases the risk of cardiovascular diseases. This type of diet interferes with normal functioning in the gut and promotes the growth of harmful microbes. And then what happens to them? These microbes, so many things happen. They convert chemicals and fatty foods into harmful metabolites that um, promote atherosclerosis. Uh, they trigger the immune system when the, the gut becomes leaky and these harmful chemicals and bacteria get leave the lumen of the gut, which is where they're supposed to stay, and cross into the tissues of the intestines and gain access to our immune system, triggering all kinds of problems, as well as our bloodstream, um, our gut bacteria not being happy will change the neurotransmitters that they secrete. I mean, so many things happen. Um, so that is another uh, uh, factor in heart disease. Here's another one. High levels of stress hormones may risk, may raise the risk of hypertension and cardiovascular disease. No, no uh, surprise there, right? So here are the bullets. The body's hormonal response to experiencing stress is a natural function that humans and animals have in common. So we're supposed to have stress. It helps to protect us. It helps us to run from the bear, right? But it's not supposed to last over long periods of time. Excessive levels of stress hormones, such as norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, cortisol, can adversely affect people's health. A new study suggests that higher levels of stress hormones may have links to an increased risk of high blood pressure and cardiovascular events. This study was published in Hypertension, the journal Hypertension, and uh, Medical News Today did a summary of what those uh, neurotransmitters, catecholamines, what those hormones do, including constricting our blood vessels, increasing heart rate and the force of contraction, relaxing our airway muscles. That's why we give epinephrine to people in having an asthma attack uh, and affecting the metabolism of glucose. How many times has someone said, oh, I'm gonna get a steroid shot for my knee and their glucose goes way out of control. Well, that's what, um, that's one of the side effects of steroids. All right. Uh, I think that's enough of the bad news. I mean, there, if, you go, if you Google heart health, what did I Google? Heart health news. That's what I Google, heart health news articles. You'll find dozens more articles, and many of them are showing things all around us that are affecting our heart health. Um, oh, there was there was this one. Again, no surprise, but your job can affect your heart health. And another article where you live can affect your heart health. Uh, just so many things. Why? Because this chronic stress and chronic inflammatory response is underneath it all. Here's some good news. And uh, this article just came out August 24th. Uh, why water is key to your heart's health. Ding, 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 ding. All right. So I'm not going to read this whole article to you, but uh, where there was a paragraph that I really liked in this article, but um, basically they're linking the article to not only sodium levels, which a lot of people, uh, when I say people, I mean, 
physicians, nutritionists, et cetera, a lot of people in the uh, medical system uh, villainize sodium. Uh, there are levels of that, but sodium is, I mean, it's something that every cell needs, every muscle twitch needs, every, um, every uh, just about every cell function, just to get energy in the cell, the main uh, enzyme is sodium potassium ATPase. So sodium is critical for our body's health. And I believe that we should salt to taste. Why is that? Because um, I, our tongues are chemical, are amazing chemical receptors. And um, I can't prove this, but I believe that the, the salt, if, when you need salt, your tongue wants you to uh, eat salty foods, right? Or when you find foods are too salty for you, you don't need the salt. I, I just, I've seen it many, many times anecdotally. I haven't looked up that research and I don't know if anybody's doing the research, but my point is salt is not something to be afraid of. Salt is something we need, but in excess, it can be a problem. So um, that is one of the things that they say that water, uh, one of the benefits of water in heart health, um, but there are others. Uh, when you are dehydrated, many uh, body functions from your brain, from your kidneys, your blood vessels, all many, many body functions are affected when you become dehydrated immediately. And then they put out hormones and neurotransmitters and um, uh, create conditions to increase the blood pressure because your brain is designed to be protected from a drop in your blood pressure. But that means it's gonna elevate your blood pressure, whether uh, that's from a sudden shock and you're gonna faint and you end up on the floor. And as soon as you hit the floor, you wake up like, ooh. <laughs> well, when you had that shocking experience, uh, your brain noticed that your, your uh, parasympathetic ner nervous system was absolutely paralyzed. Your, symp your sympathetic nervous system was overwhelmed and your blood pressure, uh, your blood was redirected to other areas other than your brain. Your brain is not having it. And it's like, nope, you need to drop right now. And evolutionarily, I could see how that's a protection. You know, if you can't run away from the bear, then it's kind of good to faint and play dead, right? <laughs> if hopefully the bear is not going to be interested in you um, under those circumstances. But uh, the effect of water and the effect of dehydration in your body is universally important to every organ to, uh, like I said, every heartbeat, every muscle twitch, th there's a delicate chemical balance that ideally, if you're in optimal health, will be in very narrow parameters. And we call that homeostasis, when you're in the normal range and all of these things. And one thing that gets out of balance will affect the entire system to make up for the balance. It doesn't get it back into balance, but it's doing things to make up for the imbalance that happened until you can change the situation. Until you can drink more water, your pulse rate's gonna go up, you know, things like that. All right, so uh, that exploration, of uh, the news about heart health and what affects heart health. And that article that I found about water made me think of some other articles that I've kept, I have them in my archives and I bring them out from time to time. Um, 
but I really wanted to share them today. So uh, these articles, um, for instance, uh, this is some research out of Japan. And this is an old article, this is 2012, but you know, we take what we can get and then we move on. So advanced research on the health benefit of reduced water. You got to love that. And I'm gonna skip forward to the conclusions. And um, here, conclusions and perspective. Remember, this is 2012. So we're almost 10 years later. Accumulating evidence has shown that reduced waters are health beneficial and they suppress oxidative stress-related diseases such as diabetes, cancer, arterial sclerosis, neurodegenerative diseases, and the side effects of hemodialysis. And let me tell you, that is a very short list. Mechanism of action of reduced water for scavenging reactive oxygen species, we've talked about ROSs, are considered to be complicated. Uh, ERW, electrolyzed reduced water, contains hydrogen molecules and mineral nanoparticles. So. There's much, much more about that, but I love that article. Um, this article, this is the latest article that I've saw, that I've uh, picked up. Now this article is a clinical trial, so it's not a review article and it's a small clinical trial, but it's a clinical trial in humans. And here's the title, hydrogen rich water reduces inflammatory responses that's a good thing, right? And prevents apoptosis of peripheral blood cells. What is apoptosis? Programmed cell death of peripheral blood cells, that's blood cells in your extremities, in healthy adults, a randomized double blind control trial. So they were looking at the effect, they were looking for evidence of beneficial effects of drinking hydrogen water as opposed to plain water. And they were given, the, the healthy adults were given a liter and a half, either of hydrogen water or plain water for four weeks. And they took measurements at the baseline, they took measurements after four weeks. Uh, and they found that uh, in, the, in the hydrogen water group, um, apoptosis was significantly less. Uh, the antioxidant potential of the person was greater. And uh, the, the inflammatory response was down-regulated. These findings suggest that hydrogen water increases antioxidant capacity, thereby reducing inflammatory responses in healthy adults. Now let's look at a, a couple of reviews. This is probably my favorite one. I've, I've brought this to you before. Molecular hydrogen, a preventive and therapeutic medical gas for various diseases. And um, I'm definitely gonna put this in the show uh, resources. Molecular hydrogen, a therapeutic antioxidant and beyond. So, so many things um, are starting to uh, validate uh, molecular hydrogen, the molecular hydrogen aspect, as, as well as the electrolyzed reduced aspect of the water. So um, I just wanted to and not only validate them, but specifically tie them into tie them directly into specific diseases such as cardiovascular disease. So 